Old pirates, yes, they rob I Sold I to the merchant ships Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit Won't you help to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever had Redemption songs Redemption songs Redemption songs There's one thing which touches every corner of the Caribbean, slavery. Everyone here is the child of that experience. On the 1st of August, another runaway caught. Put him in the bilbos, both feet, gagged him, locked his hands together, rubbed him with molasses and exposed him naked to the flies all day and to the mosquitoes all night. Two others got away. Those words came from the diary of a young Englishman who kept slaves in Jamaica in the 18th century on a plantation very much like this one. Although the English liberals led the campaign to abolish slavery, the British were the people who, more than any other, made slavery into a prosperous, thriving business. And both sides of that coin are Britain's legacy to these islands. For four centuries, the European powers fought each other bitterly for possession of these islands. The British presence started with pirates looking in these inlets for hiding places from which to attack the Spanish treasure ships. In 1655, the British formally occupied the island. Settlers soon followed, and by the 1760s, Jamaica had 680 sugar estates. Typically, the British planter's elegant home was flanked by an overseer's house, surrounded in turn by slave quarters. Slaves in those days outnumbered whites on Jamaica by nine to one. Life was pretty grim for those early settlers. The towns were hot and dirty, full of gamblers and prostitutes and part-time buccaneers. According to one traveler, Jamaica was the dunghill of the universe. Into this frontier society was thrust a young man called Thomas Thistlewood when he arrived in Jamaica on the 23rd of April, 1750. Thistlewood's diary of an overseer is fascinating because it provides a unique record of how whites treated blacks, a mixture of cruelty and intimacy which shapes their relationship to this day. Monday, the 15th of July, 1765. Attended the Negro sale in the house in Savannah La Mar, where Jimmy Hayes formerly kept a tavern. A very unfair sale, as Mr. Salmon permitted Mr. Goodwin, Dr. Walker, and Bessie Murray to pick before the sale began. Besides this, above 20 of the best slaves were left aboard and picked out before they came ashore. In regard to buying Negroes, I would choose boys and girls not exceeding 16 and 18 years old, as full-grown men and women seldom turn out so well. On this occasion, Thistlewood bought three slaves. Cyfox, a Negro man about 19 or 20 years old. Kudrow, a man Caramante, about 20 years, 5 foot 6 inches, bow shinned. Bristol, a boy, 5 foot 1 inch, Sackock country, about 17 years. I feed my new Negroes three pints of rice each per diem. All were branded on the shoulder T.T. Slave women were required to submit to their master's sexual pleasure. Thistlewood obsessively recorded, partly in Latin, his daily demands of slaves like Fibber. <laughs> Come Fibber in boiling house, stands backwards, said non bene. Said non bene, not too good that time. Tuesday, 18th. Mr. John Cope and Mr. John Dorwood dined here and got very drunk. They had Eve and Margarita. It is said Mrs. Cope's waiting maid at Paradise Estate is with child, but whether from Mulatto Davy, her husband, or Mr. John Cope, in my opinion, is doubtful. 
The planters inflicted obscene and degrading punishments on their slaves for the most trivial offences. Darby was catched eating canes, had him well flogged and then rubbed in salt pickle, lime juice and bird pepper. Also whipped Hector for losing his hole, made new Negro Joe piss in his eyes and mouth. Such treatment provoked frequent slave rebellions. Saturday, the 7th of June, 1760, was alarmed in the night by a canoe coming up the trench, but made them stop when about halfway up by threatening to fire at them. In that year's rebellion, the slaves planned to take over the estates entirely. Mr. Weech says he's afraid of being murdered in the woods. We're in the most imminent danger. All the Negroes in the island, it is said, were to have rose at Whitsuntide, but by mistake, Negroes in St. Mary's rose at Easter. Fire was to have been set to the towns in many places at once, and all the whites who came to extinguish them were to be murdered in the confusion whilst the estate Negroes engaged their overseers. Suddenly, no slave could be trusted. A general inclination to revolt appearing among all the Negroes, it was thought necessary to make a few terrible examples of some of the most guilty. Of the three found guilty of killing the whites on Ballard's Valley, one was condemned to be burnt, the other two to be hung up alive in irons and left to perish in that dreadful situation. The wretch that was burnt was made to sit on the ground and his body being chained to an iron stake, the fire was applied to his feet. He uttered not a groan and saw his legs reduced to ashes with the utmost firmness and composure, after which one of his arms, by some means getting loose, he snatched a brand from the fire that was consuming him and flung it in the face of his executioner. By the 1770s, Thistlewood owned a modest estate with some high-quality livestock. He had become a member of the Jamaican landed gentry, Justice of the Peace and Lieutenant of Savannah Lamar. He made the independent-minded Fibber his slave wife, and despite his infidelities, she lived with him until his death. Friday, 1st March, PM, cum Fibber. Thursday, PM, cum Fibber. She gave me a gold ring to keep for her sake. She also gave him a son, whom he recognized as his own. In his will, he arranged for his property to be sold and the money used to buy Fibber her freedom and build her a house. The settlers and slaves alike were beset by natural disasters. In 1786, the year Thistlewood died, the fifth hurricane in six years almost destroyed everything he'd built up. Monday, 2nd October, 1780. My dwelling house began to go, and about sunset, a little before six, the wind coming to the south, being at its height, and raging with the utmost violence and irresistible fury, tore in pieces the remainder of my house, dispersing it in different ways. Many of my sheep are dead or dying. The external face of the earth so much altered as scarce know where I am. Mr. Woodbine says there perished in the hurricane of the bay about 70 whites. That diary was written evidence of scars on the West Indian soul. Kind or cruel, the whites themselves were corrupted by slavery. Humans became more expendable than machines. At times, slave mortality was so high that three slaves had to be imported for every one that was needed. Sugar plantocracies lived in so-called great houses and ruled with arbitrary power. The mistress of the splendid Rose Hall, Annie Palmer, was so cruel that her slaves eventually rebelled and murdered her. But she also took slaves as lovers, crossing the socially forbidden line into that black and white world known as Creole, where you find the unofficial legacy of the British in the Caribbean. You can find these stony reminders of the days of empire overlooking squares all around the Caribbean. But how much of Britain is there beneath the surface in the people themselves? To look for that, you have to go to an island that was under Britain for longer than any other, the place they call Little England.
obeyed us. Even the way people waited at the traffic lights seemed to reflect a deeply internalized English sense of order. The street names have an incongruous grandeur alongside the chattel houses in which the poor still live. Everything, the towns, the parishes, the institutions, echo a world 4,000 miles away. Near one of the old sugar mills is St. Nicholas Abbey, which is still lived in by a descendant of the English family who've owned it since slavery. A visitor observed, the planters ate like cormorants and drank like porpoises. One menu included suckling pig, loin of veal, goat, a leg of pork, three ducklings and three turtle doves. The Cave family has owned the house for five generations. When I first got to know about it, my grandfather owned it and I was a boy. I didn't really quite understand much about it. I thought at one stage he owned all of Barbados. Um, but I discovered later on it wasn't his, uh, that he only owned a little bit of Barbados. Uh, but I had a map of the world and I put his initials against Barbados. And when he uh, died, I put my, grand my father's initials against it. And so one day for a laugh when it became mine, I put my initials against it. And uh, now today I'm the owner of a small part of Barbados, a very, very beautiful part of a very beautiful island. Colonel Cave settled here permanently when he retired from the British Army in 1970. He leads a bachelor life with three-day-old copies of The Times and the BBC World Service for company. His grandfather dressed his large domestic staff in starched uniforms. The British simply transplanted to the tropics wholesale the etiquette, habits and corsetry of upper-class England. That's all over now. Cat always comes up for some milk. Uh, they all know what time I come in, and they all come around, and in that way we serve them. And now I can serve you a cup of tea. Well, I've got a very nice lady who comes in every day and does a bit of cooking called Gloria, and I always forget to tell her what to produce for supper, so I end up by having to cook my own supper in the end. So it's usually something pretty simple: um, potatoes and vegetables, perhaps off the plantation, and some yams and. Um, bit of chicken or something, very simple. But I'm a very bad cook, really. <laughs> to make ends meet, Stephen Cave now offers tourists a trip around the house with an ironic commentary on his ancestors' lifestyle. Here you see a chair. This chair was made in London in about 1934 by a firm called Foot & Sons. You get in the chair in the morning, and they come along and serve you your breakfast. And you have a good, hearty breakfast there. And after breakfast, the newspaper arrives. So it's hard work in the heat of Barbados, you know, holding the newspaper. So it's a good thing if you have it up like that. And there you can read the newspaper. It would have been done 300 years ago. A uh, horse being led for the very building by now sitting in. And that's my father allowed to get on the horse. It's strange to watch the descendants of slaves listening to this son of the plantocracy describing the lives of their great-grandparents. And everybody drinks rum punches here in Barbados, and uh, he likes his rum punch. But he's got a problem, and you'll notice, you see, that when he's got his elbow there, he can't reach the rum punch. And it's hard work moving his hand like that with a rum punch <laughs> in the heat of Barbados. So what you need to do is to put it in the right place. But you see, when he's got it up here, it's still not quite right. So we put it there, and then we have to raise it up a little bit and lock it there. And then he has the rum punch where he wants it. We have a photocopy here of a valuation of the plantation in 1822 when old Mr. Cumberbatch died. It's a sad document because it shows the names of all the slaves here on the plantation listed under the men, the women, the boys, and the girls. There's one here called Kitty Grace. She's worth 120 pounds, and she would have been about 20 years old. And then after lunch, of course, the only thing to do is have a good sleep. <laughs> he goes down for the afternoon and has a, a good sleep. But gentility indoors hid some harsh realities outside. They started to introduce steam engines. You had to be very careful not to put your hand inside, because if you put your hand between there, your hand would go in and you wouldn't be able to get it out. And if you weren't quick, you'd go right through it yourself. 
And so they used to keep an old machete here, and uh, the other man would be ready, and he'd cut your hand off if, if he was quick enough and save your life. Risky business. Many sugar estates have now abandoned production, and to Stephen Cave's dismay, the Barbadian government has threatened to nationalize the rest. If they told me that they were managing the plantation and I couldn't manage it, I think uh, I'd give them a pretty difficult time, really. The property has survived as a plantation entirely through my determination to keep it going. I enjoy running this plantation enormously, and I have no desire to do anything else. I'm nearly 60 now, and uh, I hope to go on working on the plantation for as long as I possibly can. Um, and then, as far as I'm concerned, they can bury me on the plantation and make the canes grow a bit better. This house is also a legacy of the British settlement in Barbados. It's tempting nowadays to think of the British Caribbean as divided, roughly, between the descendants of those people on top, the planters, and those at the bottom, the slaves. But it was never as simple as that. The expanding sugar industry pulled in another class of settlers, the much despised and often desperately poor, poor whites. You can still see their descendants right here in Barbados. The ancestors of these red legs, as Barbadians called them, were indentured workers, men and women press-ganged into service in Britain, or the Catholic prisoners of Oliver Cromwell's grand Irish and Scottish campaigns. Others were discharged soldiers and convicts trapped in the Caribbean beyond the reach of the law. The majority of these people were men and women who, through force of circumstances, had signed away their liberties as surely as the slaves had been deprived of theirs. Today, generations later, some of them are rich. Others are still poor, like people who live around here. But all of them would say that they're just as Bajan as any black person. This is the home of a descendant of one of those poor white families, Richard Goddard. The Goddards are now among the rich of the island, but only two generations back they were typical red legs. Now everyone knows the Goddards. They are prominent among the small number of poor whites who have made it into middle class society through success in business. The family owns supermarkets, a bakery, an airline catering firm, a rum company, and a meat processing plant. Richard Goddard himself is a far cry from the old white planters. He considers himself completely Barbadian. The business grosses over 65 million pounds a year and employs 1,600 workers. That's right. Thank you. Bye-bye. And they owe it all to this one remarkable man. This photograph taken about 1900 in Bath, St. John Barbados, and it's the earliest photograph I can find of a member of my family, Thomas Henry Goddard. They're all fishermen, both black and white, and you can see it was great poverty among them. They're wearing just jute bags, sacks, with the head cut out and shoulders, and they're smoking a clay pipe, my grandfather, he, he left the parish in 1890 and walked to town with nothing. And he got a job in what they call the, the ruins, the burnt area of Bridgetown. And he was working for 60 cents for 60 hour a week, one cent an hour. Richard's grandfather rose each day at three. He worked and saved enough to give his seven children a good education. One of them, John Goddard, standing there on the left, captained the West Indies cricket team. This photograph was taken in the mid-1950s. The families are dressed formally, my father on the left. Uh, you'll notice that in a space of 50-odd 50, 50 years, we have moved from sacks to tuxedos, and that's a great improvement. <laughs> this is the home of Richard Goddard's second cousin, Evelyn. I must admit I find it very odd to meet poor white people in a tropical country. 
In London, yes, but here it seems strange. Richard Goddard regularly visits his cousin and other relatives in the area. Livestock and poultry reared in the backyard is what many red legs depend on for a livelihood. Traditionally, they keep themselves to themselves, intermarrying only with other poor whites, despising the blacks and despised by them in return. I think she looks on me as a friend, as someone that she can come to with her problems or for advice. But there's been a respect on both sides. I realize that she is a humble person and she's a person who has worked hard and a very happy person. Happy husband. Um, um. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Yes, how are you keeping? I keep them fine. Uh, how, all right. All right, right here. Yeah. She speaks a very strong Barbadian dialect. And I think that I understand her very well, and I myself would slip into that dialect very easily. It's a mixture of Scotch and Irish. Evelyn is exceptional in having married a black man. Although the couple are poor, like many Barbadians, they have to protect themselves against thieves. It is yours. One day, I got three of them. One down the kitchen, one up in that corner. Well, you got more, more, more. She explains that there's a machete ready behind every door. Yes. Evelyn, how are your Nino? How are you having had a bad knee? No, let me tell you, this is what that has yet to There are real class differences between these cousins. You'll notice she always calls him Mr. Goddard. Where are you sick that time? Oh, nothing here, so we broken up, Mr. Goddard. Mm -hmm. Then he come and look for me, man, he's great, but. The feed you in the hospital? They give me something there, but Mr. Goddard, I you can't think... cook like you. No, I can't cook either. Then they smell the fish it too raw. Oh, <laughs> they had a season in it. Mm mm, none at all. The salt. And I very salt. They're an object lesson, these poor whites, in the dangers of stereotyping the British legacy in the Caribbean. The Barbados Yacht Club, on the other hand, conforms more to type. Ralph is the life and soul of the party. He belongs to those white families who are guardians of a certain colonial lifestyle and also the island's purse strings. Although the club needs to attract more local members, so far only the waiters are black. I think that I'm closer to an African than a European because I was brought up to be Barbadian. We learned to eat, party, quarrel, fight, even talk. Uh, all of our dialect is the same thing. So, I mean, without a doubt, I'm more Barbadian African than Barbadian European, without a doubt. This was once the Royal Barbados Yacht Club, with an exclusive white membership, a bastion of colonial power and privilege. Resident British officers were automatically honorary members. I wouldn't have been allowed through the gate. friends are anxious to convince you of how truly Barbadian they feel. Although everyone behaves as if they have no care in the world, to me they seem rather trapped trying to sustain the tourist brochure, Bacardi ad view of their own island. Nowadays, blacks of the right class and income could become members, but they show little interest. I'm not surprised. Apart from the expense, echoes of the past still make us feel uncomfortable. The club's image remains that of an enclave in which an exclusive white nouveau riche set sail, drink and party all weekend. That sort of spirit of enjoyment. 
which is called Latin American or, or Caribbean. It's, it's as much a part of me as, as, as the black people. I just want to get home to see you again. Blacks now hold political power, but the economy is still run from here, a compromise that suits both sides. During slavery, the Church of England was closely identified with the planter class. Unlike the Catholics in the Spanish islands, they didn't baptize slaves. Conveniently, perhaps, because it wouldn't have been right to mistreat a fellow Christian. But Christianity has been transformed by the encounter with Africa. Diane Sheldine's parents are poor, and the whole family has contributed to the cost of a proper wedding. She could be setting out for any church in England. But Diane is a member of a breakaway black church known as the Spiritual Baptists. Founded by his lordship, Bishop Glanville Williams, in 1957, it's one of the fastest growing churches in the Caribbean, with over 180,000 members. The bishop's approach is a long way from the Church of England. They have had so many visions, and uh, too numerous to mention. I have met Jesus. I have met um, many angels. We talked. I met Moses, I met Abraham. Uh, I've even seen Adam. The prophetic language may seem out of key with the conventional idiom of Dan's dress, but it's a thread that goes right back to slavery. Black churches offered the one language in which slaves could express their dream of freedom and the promised land. And still today, spiritual baptism gives these people a dream beyond the poverty of their daily lives. Yes, I have met uh, many of the apostles and the prophets in Zion. I have visually I went to heaven. And um, I didn't know where he was, but I saw this being so tremendously big. And he came to me and told me, we are going to take you to see the palace of the great king. I said, um, this will be God. He said, yes, you will see where God live. I said, where God live on his throne? He said, no, where God live. So I was so happy. And uh, a chariot came. This place was so beautiful. As far as my eyes could behold. The green, the pastures, they're alive, but not like our grass. You know, everything was so, the trees were different. But, I mean, very unearthly. This beautiful place. I said, well, where is this? Well, the angel said to me, this is the palace of the great king. And the chariot stopped. I heard a trumpet blow. Never heard anything like it. It could wake the very heavens. And like all inside of me want to come out. And I heard this is the chariot that God rides across the heavens in. And when I came back to the place, they said, um, you will go back to the earth and tell your people what you saw. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. The revivalist churches which grew out of slavery had to borrow their forms of worship from their white masters. But they subverted them, transforming them into that unique fusion, Afro-Christianity. To love and to church. To love and church. How staid and repetitive the Anglican ritual sounds in their midst. But they get weary of the same thing over and over. The same prayers over and over. They have not changed over these years. And I think people get tired of the same thing. When at the, the spiritual church, you hardly see the same thing in a year. And we take the the most solemn hymns, even abide with me, and we make it rock and roll.